Saturday. Yeah, we have uh, more because I brought you a, a little surprise. So when the quantum stuff of this talk doesn't uh, convince you, then hopefully it's all uh, eclairs will. Um, so <laughs> please enjoy. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Close the door. Uh, yeah. 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 I think so. Uh, you have to um, um, make sure that uh, the recording is. Uh, so I think there should be some. Well, uh, on your. Uh, yes. Uh, okay. So it's running right. Let me just briefly. With the, the standard thing. So today's speaker is Marco Sift. He comes from. Where he's doing his PhD, and he will tell us about some police yeah. Exactly. Okay. So, yeah. Um, hi. Um, I'm going to tell you about a tool we were developing actually over the last uh, few years. And this tool will allow you to directly bridge the gap between experiment, so detector output from an experiment, to um, its theoretical description. For example, by a lymph blood uh, equation. And this tool heavily relies on so-called quantum pulse spectra, and this is what you're going to learn about today. Um, so I was talking about quantum measurements, so let's have a look um, at a few examples. So we actually divided quantum measurements in three different cases, um, depending on their typical, um, their typical uh, structure. So there's, for example, the Gaussian case, um, which is uh, found, for example, in a spin noise experiment, where the electron spin or the electro the orientation of the electron spin is weakly probed by a by a laser light, and due to this only weak probing, um, the detector output of your photo um, diodes will contain mostly Gaussian noise. Now the question is, how do you analyze such a trace? And the answer to this are spectra and you will find that throughout this talk almost to almost all questions the answer will be spectra um so in the power spectrum here you already see that there are uh, frequencies contained within the signal um you can already learn something about energy differences in the diagonal diagonalized hematonium of your quantum system um but this, this is not the only information that is contained within your trace there are spectra um, which are called higher order spectra so if your power spectrum is on the order of two, um, there's also the spectra of order three and order four and higher, although our theory up until now only um, takes, uh, makes use of um, up to order four. Um, so these will contain more information, um, which you can later use for analysis, but more on that later. Um, here's an example of such a... Um, of such a measurement. So this on the left-hand side, this is all simulation, but these kind of um, um, uh, spin noise experiments have already been uh, done in real life, but this is nothing new. And you can see here, for example, a single electron coupled to a multiple of uh, nuclei. So it experiences an average magnetic field and it precesses in this average magnetic field. And um, the colors decode um, different outside magnetic fields. So for a higher outside magnetic field, it processes uh, more quickly. And uh, you can not only learn about the precession frequency here, but also about the lifetime of the spin, because as you see here, this is just another sample. Here, the peak is more broadened, and the broader the peak, the, um, the smaller the lifetime of this uh, electron state. Um, Okay, then there's case two. Now, in this case, we um, stop, uh, we actually probed the quantum system strongly. So before it was weak, now it's strong. Now the quantum system has to decide whether it's in uh, one or the other eigenstate of the measurement operator, and it um, rapidly flips between uh, certain states. And this is also visible in the detector output of, for example, a um, quantum point contact next to a quantum dot. Here, the current strength um, of a bypassing current is heavily relies on the state of the ground dot, so if it's full or empty. And um, you can now deduce from this trace um, how quickly electrons tunnel into the dot or from the dot. 
Now, such traces are um, in traditionally evaluated using the so-called full counting statistics. Here you say, okay, I define my threshold around one uh, eigenstate and uh, um, around the other eigenstate and say, okay, if it's within this threshold, the dot must be full or the dot must be empty. Um, and then you just count uh, at what times the electron jumps out of the of the um, dot. But of course, this is um, this can only be an approximation and you throw away information already because you're averaging um, um, uh, just by, by using thresholds. And there can be cases like, for example, this peak here before, was there actually something happening or is it just noise or like this peak here? These are so-called spikes and they never vanish, no matter how, um, how strong you're measuring. And we say, okay, we want, we don't want to use any approximation. We want to use this raw detector output right away. And it turns out that spectra are again the answer. So we calculate the power spectrum and third and fourth order and showed that um, you can use this to characterize the system fully. So um, gain access to these um, tunneling variables. Um, now the third case is uh, a case where we go down to the single photon level. So if you think about the spin noise experiment for, from before, where we had a continuous laser stream, now we turn down the power on this laser until we can resolve single photons in our detector in the end. These photons will be Poisson, uh, will follow a Poisson distribution. And the question again is how do we analyze such a trace? And it turns out that the spectra of this raw detector output here will still contain any information an otherwise continuous measurement would do. Um, so there are the precession peaks, but there are also higher order informations um, contained within the spectrum. And this has not been treated in literature before. So um, our theory allows um, to evaluate uh, these kinds of exper uh, experiments. And um, of course, the other cases as well, and anything in between actually. It features analytic formulas for these polyspectra. So if you have your system um, defined as a Limblad um, equation, for example, you can get polyspectra, the higher order polyspectra right away. Um, your model can therefore contain Hamiltonians, damping constants, so you can incorporate temperature. And the measurement as well. We will see how the measurement affects um, your uh, quantum system's evolution uh, in a few minutes. However, there's, there's one... Um, Thing you have to keep in mind, which is that parameters within your model needs to be time independent. Um, so you can have no driving term in your uh, Lindblad uh, equation, although you could perform some tricks like move into a rotating frame or something uh, to get rid of time dependence. Okay, so this is what we're um, what we're using. Now, how does the system characterization work? Um, sorry, just coming yes. back. Um, uh, like I said that this should be time independent. So. Um, does it explicitly then exclude any quenches? So, for example, like sudden edit return to the Hamiltonian, uh, which would be, or sudden change in the, in the Hamiltonian itself. Mm -hmm. Also, yes, yes. quenches would be also included or excluded in this case. Well, um, if you, if this is something that is changing the Hamiltonian, no, or in changing it in the Hamiltonian, I change one parameter uh, instantly from one wide value to the other one. Yeah, this so would, would be this would be um, a no go basically. Would not work. Yeah, okay. would not work. Um, yeah. This you is steady state observation of yeah. the system. Yeah. Okay. okay. You can maybe find a get around um, by because when you mention Lindblad equation, in principle they are used to in particular to study the <laughs> time evolution of the system. Yes. You yes. Use, uh, mm -hmm. Some mm -hmm. sudden perturbation. Yeah. Or you introduce a quench in your system. Mm -hmm. So in this regard, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. not fully understanding why by treating it within the mm -hmm. you are not able to okay. take into account the time. The difference. more fundamental reason is that spectra can only be calculated from um, if your signal is stationary. Mm -hmm. So, um, and the signal, yeah, and if you change the Hamiltonian at one point, uh, you lose stationarity. Okay. Um, and yeah, this makes sense. You could use, you could calculate the spectra before the quench and after the quench, but not uh, with one really? sudden change. Uh, sudden change. Yes. All right. Um, so we have our measurement. We know that we want to use polyspectra. How do we characterize the system with these uh, with this tool? 
Um, first of all, we calculate the uh, pull spectra from the measurement itself. Afterwards, we define via the stochastic master equation, actually. So it's a little bit more than just a Lindblad equation. It incorporates also the measurement itself. Um, we think about a stochastic master equation um, that can um, uh, resemble the system we want to study. Um, and we use our analytic formulas to calculate the pulse spectra from the stochastic master equation. And then we use the least squares fit to now tweak parameters in the stochastic master equation until the spectra overlap. And if the spectra overlap, we say, okay, we found a system that shows the same dynamics as our whatever measured system we have. Um, all right, so this is where we want to go. And I want so to be. Yeah. How many parameters do you need to fit? Um, this depends on your system. Um, so for your quantum dot example, for example, um, is uh, there you need just two parameters, the in and out tunneling rate, maybe together with the measurement strength, because there can be weak and strong measurements. And this can be tuned um, continuously, actually. So this would be three parameters. But of course, if you have a nucleus coupled to a spin with temperature, maybe, then it can be five six parameters yeah and then of course you need um highly confidential uh highly, you need to be confident in your uh, information so you need a lot of measurement time in order to get uh as less noise as possible for in such a high level spectrum yeah it all depends on how much data is available actually okay so there are two bridges that we need to get, which is how do we get from measurements to polyspectra, and how do we get from mass equation to analytic polyspectra. And this is what I want to show you. Um, so first of all, let's gain some intuition about higher order information. What does it actually mean? And there is a neat example. Um, here uh, is the, I calculated the polyspectra of a, a standard C major plot on a piano. Once uh, the notes are being played simultaneously, and in the other case, they are played one after the other, so never um, together. And looking at the pulse spectrum, you can see okay, there are three notes contained within the signal, they have a certain intensity, that's all right. However, I cannot decide between these two cases just using second order information. And this is where higher order spectra come in. If you look at the um, fourth order spectrum, you can see that it varies um, quite drastically between these two cases because the fault on the uh, spectrum shows you an intensity intensity correlation um, of this uh, within your signal. So in the first case, all these frequencies arise and fall together, so they are positively correlated and the off diagonals are red, so positive. In the second case, the nodes always avoid each other, so they are the, these three peaks are negatively correlated, which you also can see in the off diagonals. And this is uh, very neat information, which you can also use for quantum systems, as we will see later. Now, the third order spectrum is a little bit harder to interpret. Um, it shows contributions of two um, frequencies, and their sum are phase correlated. This is the case for higher harmonics, for example. So, if you have a look at the uh, first and second harmonic of the C here, uh, we would see a contribution, or if you mix signals, then this also uh, leads to phase correlation um, between two um, between between two C frequencies and their sum. Okay, um, so now getting the signal from the detector, how do we arrive at the final pole spectrum? First of all, you need something like a analog to do digital converter, which sits inside your PC. This is like a graphics card, and um, this sits in this very PC, which sits under my desk. And um, it then moves the moves the signal as quick as possible to the GPU. Um, because the quicker you are, the higher frequencies you can analyze. Um, there it then performs a Fourier transform. And to gain access to the power spectrum, you do something like the um, absolute square of your Fourier coefficients. And to arrive at higher order spectrum uh, spectra, you do uh, yeah you, you do have to calculate these expressions here where the brackets uh, the angle brackets mean means. Um, now this the the fastest system we have so far can perform um, 
can analyze with a two gigahertz real time bandwidth. So we can analyze signals up to uh, two gigahertz, um, which of course are a lot. So we just have to plug in an antenna to this analog to digital, digital converter. And we immediately see that the air is full of these signals. Um, there will be Wi Fi, uh, Wi Fi, yeah, for example, Wi Fi, although Wi Fi is faster than two gigahertz, so uh, we cannot analyze this. Um, but radio signals, of course, household phones, there's a lot in this sub two gigahertz range. And if you zoom in on, in on one of these peaks here, for example, you can see a radio signal, which is frequency modulated. Now that it is frequency modulated is something you only see in the higher order um, spectrum because um, frequency modulation works by moving just one frequency um, in the spectrum slightly. So there's only just one frequency sent. And this is something you can see in the off diagonals again. These are correlated negatively. So a completely different signal would be a digital one from a household phone. Here you have rather discrete frequencies and they're positively correlated. So you can actually decode the modulation scheme using uh, high order information. Okay, but I know that you're here for hardcore theory, so let's dive in. Higher order spectra are defined uh, by Brillinger in 1965 um, via the so called cumulants of the Fourier transform signal. More on that in a minute. But you can see already from this formula that the power spectrum will depend on one variable. So it will be one dimensional, as you also know it. Um, the second, uh, the third order spectrum will be two dimensional. And the fourth order will actually be three-dimensional, although I've shown you just a two-dimensional cut up, up until now, and it was also sufficient to characterize quantum systems, um, uh, all quantum systems that we had a look so far, and of course saves computational costs, like a lot of computational costs. Um, so now we know that spectra are based on cumulants. So this is not just the absolute square that we need to uh, calculate the power spectrum, but there's there are more terms. And these terms um, are given by the cumulants. So cumulants are maybe um, less known than moments, but can build uh, can be built from moments. So the first order moment, as you know, is just the mean. Uh, the first order cumulant uh, is also just the mean. The first difference arises in the second order, where now the cumulant uh, is equivalent to the covariance definition. And if you set uh, y to x, you end up with the definition of this, uh, uh, the variance, which you all have used to calculate um, errors in measurements. Um, the third order and fourth order gets increasingly more um, uh, difficult and have increasingly more terms. Now, the third order is some kind of measure for the skewness of a um, of a distribution, so the asymmetry of a distribution, and the fourth order is a measure for the bipartiteness of a distribution. So if, it's, uh, if it has two peaks, for example. Um, so okay, now you might ask, okay, why cumulants? Why all this mess? Well, they have a pretty nice, they have pretty nice properties. Um, one is that they are uh, linear in a sense that the sum of two, the cumulants of the sum of two independent stochastic processes is equal to the uh, sum of the cumulant of each um, stochastic process. This means that background noise can now be easily subtracted. So you could perform a measurement once with probe on, also with connection to the quantum system, once um, just the background, and you can subtract these two, um, these two uh, uh, spectra. That's something you always want to do, and this is not possible when calculating spectra moment based. Now another thing is that cumulants are uh, have the property of if you calculate higher and higher cumulants, um, you only gain new information about your uh, distribution, meaning that, for example, the mean is already covered in the first cumulant, so it's subtracted here in the second cumulant. Another feature is that the higher you get in cumulant order, the more noisy your estimation of this cumulant will become. And at some point, you can say, OK, now this cumulant is not significant anymore. I'm done. I've extracted all the information there is in my signal. So this is this is also quite nice because it gives you certainty that you have done everything you could. And also has the advantage that the spectra will not include, con contain any data functions, uh, which moment-based spectra do. 
Okay, so now we know how to calculate the uh, full spectra. Let's get into quantum measurements. So how do we model strong quantum measurements? Um, and the easiest setup is the Stangala setup, where a single spin is uh, applies to the apparatus. It has to decide of being up or down and uh, during the detection. Now, if the spin is part of a larger quantum system, we say, okay, this larger quantum system is described by a density matrix row. It has a part of it which is being measured and part of it which just remains during measurement. Um, we have to decide on our measurement operator and, of course, uh, uh, apply it to the eigenstate. It will spit out the eigenvalue. Now, how does the density matrix evolve during measurement? First of all, the measured part will definitely now be in state nu because this is the state we have measured. The rest of the density matrix will result from a projection of the subsystem onto nu. And the rest of the sub uh, density matrix might also change if there was an um, entanglement between rest and measured part. It also, we also need to now um, normalize it again. And this makes the whole equation nonlinear in row. Our detector output here is now easy because the detector output is just the eigenvalue, which was spit out during measurement. Now, these are strong measurements. With this, you could kind of model a telegraph noise. So the second case, how do we model the first case? How do we model weak measurements? And this can be done by simply rebuilding the uh, spin, uh, spin noise experiment. We have, again, these probe spins, which we want to measure in the end. Um, we um, so there flies pro uh, one after the other flies by a um, more complex quantum system, and let's say we want to measure the orientation of this yellow spin here, the z orientation. So we say, okay, there's a z z coupling here, and depending on the uh, the orientation of this yellow spin, the um, the probe spin will um, experience a pre uh, experience a precession uh, clockwise or anticlockwise. Um, and this will slightly change the outcome of the Stangal experiments. And here, this is again measured strongly. So the probe spin is measured strongly, but carries little information about the complex quantum system, which is therefore measured weakly. Okay. Um, yes, and the, and the interaction strength uh, called beta in our formulas. Um, this is something you can vary continuously. And this is how we get from this noisy. Um, Gaussian case to, uh, to the telegraph noise case. There's a strong measurement, and the detector output will now contain partial information about the z-orientation of our yellow spin, and um, which is in formulas given as the expectation value of uh, sigma z times the density matrix, and Gaussian noise, because this is still a probabilistic experiment. We are not rotating the probe spin to complete down or complete up. Another thing happens, which is the probe spin um, during interaction, the probe spin entangles with the more complex quantum system, which will result in a back action during the measurement, such that the yellow spin um, tends towards the measured state. So it will push towards, will be pushed towards the measured state. Okay, um, so more rigorously, this is derived in the stochastic mass equation, where you again have the detector output, where the system contribution, so the expectation value of rho with the measurement operator, goes as beta squared, this was the measurement strength, plus a little bit of noise background, um, here gamma, this is delta correlated white noise, which just goes as beta. So as you increase beta, you get relatively more information from the system and less noise but also push the system towards the measured state. Um, yes, and the density matrix, for the density matrix, there's also an equation. Um, it, of course, tries to evolve um, according to its Lindblad operators, so uh, yeah, Lindblad operators or damping terms, but also according to its Hamiltonian. And in addition, there will be measurement damping because we are affecting the, measure, the system we are measuring. And also measuring uh, measurement back action. And this term here contains the measurement result. Uh, so this is the expectation value here and pushes the system towards its measured state, just as you would expect. And this equation has been reinvented several times and derived several times. So this is uh, well established. And this is the foundation for all our uh, further theory. Uh, what is about this dissipation? Genre? 
Yeah. You add here typically in uh, in it is done phenomenologically, is that you add this dissipation term. So mm -hmm. you, I mean usually it's an interaction with the wire. Yes. But you put it more or less uh, like a usual form mm -hmm. of uh, you know like you know, type uh mm -hmm. presupposed precession. So you so how it is chosen in your case, you, you um, put yeah, it more yeah. as yeah, we say, for example, a spin is coupled to a bath, outside mm -hmm. bath, and um, then um, these damping terms will result in, for example, a temperature, a certain temperature in the, okay. for the spin. So this the spin will end up in a mixed state. Um, and also, so this is the one thing. The other thing is that for quantum dots, when the electron is tunneling into and from the dot, these um, tunneling events can also be described by damping terms because they are probabilistic. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is these are the cases where we use um, where we use these stamping terms. So, uh, this is Marco of the approximation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, the reason I'm asking is because we are looking at the moment uh, a little bit into the non television system, which we can mm -hmm. look uh, so, you know, as any dissipation in the system in a kind of way where right. the energy becomes uh, magic that the wires. So, so out of the little eigenstates, states, you start to get okay. the uh, values which have a real and magic report. Okay. <laughs> And uh, that's also one of the ways you can describe uh, dissipation in the system. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm just curious whether that would be an alternative way of looking at it. But oh, okay, yeah, it might be maybe equivalent. Yeah. Yeah. Some... Uh, I think, in fact, this complex energies they show up in the list of the piece. Right, right, right. right, right. right, right. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> Let's talk about it later. Um... <laughs> So let's see uh, what this stochastic mass equation can do and have a quick demo mm -hmm. of what happens uh, to a light mode in a cavity during measurements of its electric and magnetic field. So you can well, think of it. Maybe just okay. uh, come back. Okay. Of course, the dissipation will add you a temperature that's the most trivial thing mm -hmm. you can see about the quantum system, which has interaction. Mm -hmm. uh, and this interaction may fi finally bring electricity in some sense. We know it's from uh, many body theories that you acquire the self energy, the self and shelf energy get real and measuring component, and your energy become uh, also acquire dissipation okay. in lifetimes, not because of the temperature, and, uh, but because of the interaction process in the system. Okay, okay, yeah. But this... so you don't look in, uh, I guess you're not looking into the, let's say, couple of dots or uh, interaction, whereas, uh, whereas there is uh, some collective uh, quantum dynamics may appear. Uh, yes, yes, we do. You do. You know, yes. yes, we look at coupled spin spin systems. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, electron spin with a nuclear spin, and uh, yeah. we have many peaks. And yes. also, yeah. it's with, and yes. so depending on measurement yes. strength, so you see, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. there will be many examples coming. Yes. Okay. Yeah. okay, and this is the first one. Um, when we measure a thermal state and a uh, Fox state with four photons uh, in a cavity. This is a coherent state uh, shown in phase space, or the Wigner function is shown. So, uh, um, yeah. And you can think of this measurement as measuring position and momentum of a harmonic oscillator um, simultaneously. So let's see how a thermal state and a Fox state evolve during measurement. Turns out that they slowly decay towards a coherent state. And this fluctuating coherent state is um, exactly what we expect because it's the most classical state, which is achieved via uh, measurement. And um, of course, our measurements cannot be infinitely sharp. We're still bound by uncertainty. So we end up with this uh, state here. Oh, yes. And uh, as soon as the state is then pure, um, the stochastic mass equation conserves purity because we don't throw away any information, don't end up with a big state due to measurement. Okay, now we know how to measure. How do we get to the poly spectra? And you hopefully remember that we need to calculate something like this here. We need the Fourier transform of the signal and then calculate the cumulant of it. Here, the second cumulant for the uh, second order spectrum. Um, or an equivalent formulation could be given via the Wiener Kinchin theorem, where you calculate uh, first of all the cumulant and then the, uh, the Fourier transform. And something like this, the first to do something like this was Landau in the 1980, uh, 1950s, <laughs> um, where you can see a similar expression as above uh, in the Heisenberg picture. Um, and then you fully transformed it and called it um, uh, the noise spectrum. 
Now, he gave no derivation for this uh, formula. He just said it must be defined as uh, this. Uh, I guess he must have left it as an exercise to the reader. And there have been many readers, and they found shortcomings uh, for this formula. It, for example, doesn't work for um, dense systems because, as you see here, this integral goes to minus infinity. Now, if your system is damped, your measurement uh, results or expectation value will tend towards infinity too. So this diverges. This can't work for uh, dam systems. And it also has no cumulant like expressions. So our nice cumulant um, properties uh, also don't apply. Um, so in the magic year of 2018, um, three groups were independently able to derive multi time moments of the stochastic, uh, of the detector output of the stochastic mass equation. And one of these groups uh, yeah, was our group. And um, let's have a look at these moments. These, because they're quite intuitive, um, you can build the mean. You can get the mean from just the steady state of your um, density matrix, which is also yeah, here's already also a reason where you need the steady state. Um, yeah, this one is you make use of this steady state condition. Um, apply a measurement to it, so this is the measurement super operator, and take the expectation value. This is your first moment. Second moment works accordingly. You take your system, measure once, let it evolve <laughs> between the two, the two times, T1 and T2, and take the expectation, measure again, and take the expectation value, where this G is just the solution to the that equation. Third moment works um, just as well. And these few uh, formulas feature now, um, without approximation, a method to derive, uh, to calculate the moments from your detector output. It works with uh, environmental damping, so temperature, as said before. It works with measurement back action, uh, which is important, and is valid for any time order. You're, so you don't have to worry about anything, basically. <laughs> this is the nice thing about them. Now we just need the put it into the cumulant expressions as um, so as I told you before, and then we have just a Fourier transform away from our Kanapur spectrum. So, so we have our moments. Now we could plug them into these formulas from before, um, although we need to save on computational complexity because uh, when um, the density matrix grows and n times n matrix, which has already grown exponentially with uh, Hilbert space dimensionality. Then these propagators L and G are already double exponentially. So there's always it's always nice to take some matrix multiplications here. And it turns out that um, by redefining this propagator and um, subtracting the steady state uh, uh, steady state evolution um, from the propagator as well as the measurement operator, you end up with formulas for the cumulant expressions for the detector output, which are just as short as moments of expressions. You can see here for the second order cumulant, um, for the second order cumulant, there's this delta function here, which arises due to this white noise background that I told you uh, from before. And the rest is system system evaluation, uh, system contribution. Same is true for third and fourth order. Um, so we uh, managed to reduce these 15 fourth order times to three, and we just got one term for the third order. These cumulants decay exponentially for time, uh, infinite time uh, steps. So we have a zero mean, which uh, makes the Fourier transform free from delta functions. And this is then the most general, uh, these are the most general higher order multi time correlators for continuous quantum measurements. Now let's perform a Fourier transform. And here are the Fourier, uh, the Fourier spectra. So this delta function resulted in a constant background here. And it's important to mention delivers these peaks, which you've seen before. Now this can be implemented less on a GPU because these are large matrices, as I told you before. And now we can plug in any system we want. So for example, case one, the spin noise experiment again. Um, we have our nucleus. It was actually uh, done with a nine half nucleus, which means it has 10 different states stored uh, so that the electron now experiences 10 different magnetic fields um, if the nucleus is in a position of all of its states. 
And let's see what the spectrum looks like. Um, so as you can see, there are these 10 different magnetic fields encoded in the precession frequency of the electron. Um, so you can already gain a sense of uh, the level structure again of, of your system. Um, since Z of T, the output reveals uh, the spectral weight. However, as I told you, there's more to be learned now than just the intensity of the frequencies. So let's, let's have a look at the correlation spectrum because these are quite interesting. Um, have a look at the, uh, the this right case here. So these are for the highest magnetic field we have calculated, um, this case here. And as you can see, neighboring frequencies are correlated positively. And frequencies from the other side of the spectrum are correlated negatively. And this can be explained by the fact that the, um, the measurement reveals some of the nucleus total angular momentum. And it therefore only contains frequency compatible with this total angular momentum. Um, in other words, this, the, um, the, the nucleus does not simply flip. It moves, um, it moves smoothly. Now, another case where higher order information is crucial is if you, for example, want to decide if um, the coupling between electron and nucleus is isotropic or anisotropic. Because in the power spectrum, you see almost no difference. They have mostly the same structure. However, in the um, correlation spectrum, you can see it right away. Um, since in the isotropic case, all the frequencies are, positive, uh, are negatively correlated. Sorry, isotropic and isotropic and mean in the context of the spin space. So that's uh, S dot S uh, spin interaction, or is this kind of easy time? This is, what, what this is just X, X interaction in the Hamiltonian. So there, in the Hamiltonian, there's the sigma X times sigma X, once from nucleus, once from spin. So the spin is only um, affected by the X direction of the nucleus? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, okay. If it would be full, there would be sigma X, sigma X, sigma Y, sigma yes, Y, sigma exactly. Z, sigma yes. Z. Yes. That would be fully symmetric, mm -hmm. spin rotation of symmetric Yes, yes. You have yes. Have a, yes. Some yes, yes. So this is just X, X. Yeah. So it, the, it would be the, easy type, right? So it's only yeah. one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in the anisotropic case, the total angular momentum is a good quantum number, which is not the case for the anisotropic. That's only a quantum number. Yeah. All right. So I hope I have convinced you about higher order spectra. <laughs> So but, um, is it understood why you only have anisotropic in this case? Why you only have, I mean, because usually if you write Hamiltonian, mm -hmm. it is speaking right at fully symmetric. Mm -hmm. typically. So what decides upon the anisotropy? I mean, this you don't know, but uh, yeah. why in this particular case it's so anisotropic? Is there any some reason why the interaction must be anisotropic? I think it was um, to give an example for uh, the usage of higher order. So in the- Oh, in the, you are not looking at some experimental system. Yes, it's it looks, okay. so the isotropic case, which um, corresponds to the exact, uh, to the experiment itself. Um, mm -hmm. And the anisotropic was just uh, uh, an example for the usage of higher order. Means for, for the system that you look at, mm -hmm. uh, that was uh, experimental mm -hmm. magnitude. You present or just or yeah. no, this, there's no expert experience. No expert. There's no give you, ah, okay. give you an example of what would okay. be okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um all right. So this also works for a single quantum dot. Um we have taken uh, measurements from the from the log group in Duisburg Essen, which you can see here and calculated um, the power spectrum, but also higher order spectra, and now performed this fit to these two system parameters. And as you can see here, the model fit and the measurement above, they match uh, very nicely for third order and for fourth order. And we were um, therefore directly able to directly compete with the full counting statistics. So essentially the same information for multiple um, for multiple uh, tunneling rate, um, yeah, but without these approximations and without defining thresholds. So this worked all automatically, uh, which was a nice demonstration. Plus, we are not limited by noise. So this um, telegraph noise could also be hidden beyond a large uh, Gaussian background or not even exist because if you are uh, measuring weakly, you don't force the system to reveal its quantum state. So here, 
uh, maybe for an explanation, these these uh, the fine blue uh, bright, uh, light blue line in the background is what you measure, and this dark blue line here is something that we call a quantum demon would see um, because it's just the expectation value of the quantum dot state, which is which was which would not be accessible in the experiment. However, here it allows you to see that you're not um, projecting the state. You can, however, still calculate polyspectra and fit a simulation, so measurement, uh, measurement was in this case, and the analytical polyspectra can break agreement and characterize the system. Of course, you need more measurement time than uh, in the less noisy case. And yeah, as I said, this would be impossible with traditional methods and allows you to fit the parameters. Now we have also looked at, uh, as an example, at two coupled quantum dots where the charge would oscillate coherently between those. And for a weak quantum measurement, uh, you don't suppress the Hamiltonian dynamics. So you're, you're still uh, allowed to have um, oscillations. And these oscillations are then directly visible in the power spectrum. Now, if we increase measurement strength, these oscillation frequency peaks uh, start broadening due to measurement strength. And they also move towards zero because um, by measuring, we essentially stop coherent dynamics. This is called the quantum zeno effect. And for the strongest case here, there is no, there are no oscillations at all. We have all the frequencies have been um, pulled towards zero and we end up with telegraph noise again. Now the third case can be also implemented with our case uh, uh, with our machine in our machinery because um, we can just say okay we don't want to measure the system directly we want to measure it with single photons so why not add the single photons uh, because uh, we just increase the Hilbert space um, plug in uh, uh, essentially three states for the photons because they can be it can be up down or um, Epson. And then we let the photon interact with the system and afterwards move it towards the detector where, where it is then strongly measured. And these single photons produce then these clicks in the trace. Um, so we measure the probe, not the system, but again, the probe will contain information about the system. Hence, we uh, measure the system weekly. Um, the probe is modeled via incoherent tunneling, tunneling. So also why are the stamping terms? This is also a use of the stamping terms. Um, and um, yes, this, these are continuously uh, strong measured and are written in one new million. They also, a nice feature which comes basically for free is that they are Poissonianly Poissonianly distributed, uh, just like photons from a, a weak laser. So this actually resembles the uh, experiment quite closely. And these experiments can now be described on a more fundamental level and also evaluated. Uh, okay, so that's for the last thing um, measure a, a single spin via single photons. So you have to you have the spin um, evolution here. And whenever a photon is interacting with the spin and hit by the detector or hits the detector, um, you have this measurement back action during in the spin evolution. And this will disturb spin evolution up to the point where for high photon rates, uh, you broaden this, um, this peak in, in, um, in the spectrum of this blue uh, trace here. So these are just the spectra of this press and the pre the peak, the, yeah, the, the once sharp peak gets broadened and also moves towards zero. And if you increase um, the photon rates ever more, um, you will see that this peak broadens and moves towards zero slowly until it eventually reaches the zero zero regime where you have stopped coherent evolution completely. Um, higher order information is also just as well contained within um, within these clicky traces, um, although they show a Poissonian background due to the finite interaction uh, duration with probe and system, and also contain a striped structure, but um, we believe the uh, we can uh, subtract these stripes structures anyway. 
although they're not a problem for fitting because our model will produce just the same artifacts. So um, we can just use whatever we get. Um, this is similar to uh, classical random time sampling. There were already ideas, uh, but we brought it to the quantum world. And these overall features persist to ultra low photon rates. What I mean by this is that the average photon rate does not need to be higher than your typical system dynamics, which is first of all counterintuitive because you think um, you might think that uh, this leads to undersampling if you use too little uh, uh, too little sampling rate. Um, but remember that we are not probing with even time steps, but we are probing with a Poisson distribution. So eventually there will be two photons close by in time, which will then probe high frequencies. So there's all information uh, still contained, even at ultra low uh, probing rates. Um, yes. So the main thing I want you to take away from this talk is that we are the guys that you should call if you're ever dealing with continuous quantum measurements, because our theory resolves all shortcomings from um, earlier theories. We are using cumulant expressions, high order spectra. You can tune measurement strength as you like and incorporate external depth also. Okay, so uh, as a summary, our group before my time unified uh, different measurement regimes and generalized third and fourth order quantum polyspectra. And this then gave uh, me the opportunity during my PhD to uncompromisingly evaluate telegraph noise. We did this on the experiment uh, continuous for continuous and single photon measurements. Um, I published a public Python package, which is called SignalSnap, um, with which you can calculate spectra um, from large data sets, also using GPUs. And this is something experimentalists and look forward to because they can now um, describe new classes of experiments at low photon rates. And to help them even more, we tried to build uh, equipment for experimentalists um, to calculate these spectra in real time in the lab, and therefore characterize system in real time, systems in real time. We're also working on formulas for simultaneous measurements, as uh, for the example of the uh, life field in the cavity. And we also think about calculating, um, bringing our calculations to larger systems, so reducing matrix size maybe by using tensor networks, and of course uh, try to evaluate more and different systems, maybe for circuit or cavity quantum electrodynamics. So thank you for your attention and all your comments. Sure. Very nice talk. Uh, Thanks. Now, um, uh, very nice uh, talk. Let me try to understand. So, you mentioned that they have some system of coupling speeds. Mm -hmm. If I have, um, let's say, it's a uh, one of the things that means that I have a mm -hmm. uh, situation where my ground state of the speed chain is changing uh, you know, from one to another for this crossing point. Mm -hmm. So my system undergoes a transition. Mm -hmm. So I guess that in this body spectrum, you should immediately be able to see, like you see the type of uh, interaction among the spins, but you should also be able to see the ground state of the system or the change of the ground state. Mm -hmm. but I don't immediately understand what it would result, uh, what you would expect. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. System. I mean, would be would be this uh, setup also looking for higher momentum. Of high order commodants would be a useful tool, for example, to describe the quantum phase of the system. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess you could do this because um, I guess for different phases, maybe two different spins in your icing chain or so would be correlated differently. And if you have the upcoming formulas for simultaneous measurements, you can look at the measurement on one spin and the other spin, and this will then change depending on, I guess, damping a damping parameter or no, no. Coupling parameters. Coupling parameters. Coupling parameters. Yeah. Yeah, I'm assuming you could see that. Yes. This would be asking whether you would take long range or right. Right. Uh, yes. Is yes, of course. Can yeah. Yeah. The long yeah. Range order. yeah, yeah. As I said, you can look at different spins, like on the opposite side of the chain. You can measure them both and then correlate the measurement. And if it shows correlation, they will show up in the higher order spectrum. Yeah. 
any deviation from Gaussian has to show up in the handle mm -hmm. Then you're only limited by your function part. So, so what does a uh, typical size system that we can look at? The largest one has uh, 40 levels. So 40 levels um, are... 40 levels, it means uh, to, for where single site is a two-level system? Um, yeah, so in we had 40 states. Let's say 40 states. Um, our state vector would have 40 entrance, uh, entrances. So it yeah. would be 10 sites if I have an easing type of... Uh, but then, but then, yeah, we're already in the path, yeah, yeah. because we're growing from it. Actually, yeah. So this was a, uh, let's say you have a 20 state nucleus coupled to an electron. This would then result in a 40 times 40 density matrix because you multiply dimensionality during tensoring. Mm -hmm. And um, this is your density matrix. Now you do William as a super operator for the density matrix, meaning it has a Side length of already 40 times 40. Mm -hmm. um, so you're already at 1,600. I see. So it means yeah. it's very expensive. This would be possible, but we also now are heading to larger systems. So, but then we have, we have to come up with new ideas. So, learn new techniques like tensor networks. And you also, if you don't want to evaluate the analytic expressions on the higher order spectra, you can just uh, simulate the system and then just like an experiment. And then you get some noisy spectra, which for me sometimes is okay. And it is possible to simulate this without, uh, without the super operator formalism used. With all almost no support from the so this greatly reduces some of the cost. Yeah. You see, take this this plus mass equation is an equation of motion for the density matrix, but it can be replaced by uh, just by a uh, Schrodinger equation type thing. So this greatly reduces uh, the number. Of Number of numbers. But <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. have to do a simulation for a long time, you still need those fast computers. Graphic RAM and graphics memory is appreciated. Yeah. Oh, I think if there are no more version questions, then let's yeah. thank Marcus again. Yes, it's still around and the faculty for a while. A lot of work. <laughs> so you you were still here at least for two years, right? At least two years. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Stan. <laughs> <laughs>